with that contemplative piece ringing in our ears. So basically, God, is this what you want? <laughs> Moses holding up the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, as it's sometimes called, found in the book of Exodus, also found in the book of Deuteronomy, where the Ten Commandments are unpacked a little more deeply than they are in Exodus. Just a reminder, Deuteronomy means ten law. So this is central to the Exodus experience of the early Israelites. And our focus this season of Lent is moving us away from the thou shalt nots to the thou shalt let go. This is part three of five, perhaps parts, maybe six parts, if we go through Palm Sunday, to be determined. We're, we're still on the first four commandments. Today, the fourth commandment, the last commandment before we pivot and turn to the Exodus vision the God of the Exodus vision of an inclusive community in commandments five through 10. So let's hear now the fourth commandment before us. It is the longest commandment, this holy pause between the God who is exclusive to Israel. He's a very jealous and zealous God. Don't have any other gods before me in one through three. And then a very inclusive community between this exclusive God and this inclusive community, this holy pause, this Sabbath day. And every one of you here is observing this in one way this hour. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. For six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave at the time, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. None do any work, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us, the church. Would you pray with me? Lord, release us this hour from fears too many to name, from anxieties without name or beyond naming. O oh Lord, set us free. Amen. We now have before us a summary of commandments one through three on the next slide. Our God of liberation is our God of liberating today. That's our part of our congregational charge, as you see on the right, is this God of liberation upon which all ten commandments rest. And as we heard a couple of weeks ago, it's really built in as part of the first commandment. We learned the first commandment as you shall have no other gods before me. But many traditions beyond our Reformed tradition, I think they get it right when they wrap in that first part, the identity of that Exodus God, which then leads us to let go of our enslavement in the first commandment, to let God set us free, to let go of our fear of scarcity in the second commandment. We don't need any other gods, God says. I will provide. There is enough. I am enough. And finally, let go of defining God, that is, defining God, a good as God, lifting up an idol or circumscribing that God, that is, drawing a circle around God and this determining in some fashion that we may have some doctrines or a pious prayer, prosperity theology, any sort of theology that anything we can put exactly in the words. Notice it doesn't say, you shall name God rightly. You shall not misuse God's name. And God, knowing that, says, you know what? I'm an awesome God. I'm a God of all. We, you, I cannot be defined, only described. 
I cannot be captured, only conveyed. And so this sort of ephemeral, effusive, imminent God hiding in the cloud and the shadow, if you will, says, worship only me, but don't misname me. This is our exclusive God who intends to draw us out of that particularity into an inclusive community. But first, between that exclusive God, commandments one to three, and that inclusive community, commandments five through 10, we have the fourth commandment today. And I wanna address you, if you can drop the slide, and say welcome to March, Women's History Month. And I would like to dedicate this message about the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, to many women, to my late mother, Anita, my wife, Rosa, and every overworked and overachieving an overburdened woman I know who long for the deep peace of Lenten and Sabbath rest in their life. That they and all of us may know that in the words of the old hymn, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. Not to draw nearer to God, mind you, but not like Icarus of old flying too close to the sun, but being drawn near to the heart of God, the restfulness of the Sabbath day among us. And today's message is about the importance of remembering that God of rest, part of God's very identity that she calls us to receive and to remember the Sabbath day, the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The Sabbath day, that's the day that God rested from all that God has created. So who are we to know any better? And maybe, just maybe, we can learn something from God's example for us all. If God can rest after creating everything in Genesis 1 and 2, not that we might draw closer to God, but that we might draw closer to God's love for us, that place of restful, that restfulness near to the heart of God. Sabbath. Let's look at the fourth commandment slide now. Each week I've been offering at the top of the day's commandment, what this commandment counteracts, what it's speaking over and against, why is it here? And that is to counteract the amnesia. It returns us to Genesis 1 and 2, remember the Sabbath day. God has already introduced this in the Genesis experience. And it counteracts for us today our workaholism. I did not think I knew what workaholism was until I moved to DC. And I think many of us resemble that remark. Sabbath counters workaholism, our restlessness, our anxiety, helping us to let go from playing God. Now, personally, that comes out sometimes, oftentimes in our sense of control our control of our environment and our surroundings around us, which can be a good thing, but these commandments always are about clearing the way of the good so that we can see God. And perfectionism is not always a good thing. That's a way our control, of course, is manifested often. But I really want to call attention to the blue, sort of the light blue print you see on the right. Walter Brueggemann has written a wonderful new book. Uh, he's an esteemed Old Testament scholar. And Brueggemann's new book is called Sabbath as Resistance. He also prevents, presents it as an alternative. 
but the focus of his book is on Sabbath as resistance, resistance to what he calls the demands of empire around us. And you see manifestations of empire as he has listed it. And I have found a correlation between those manifestations of pro produce, conquer, acquire, and consume with the invitation to the kingdom table below, took, blessed, broke, and gave. Production, of course, has been celebrated as a, not only a good, but as a God in our world. I asked our Bible study yesterday, our participants, which one of these manifestations hits closest to home for you? And they said, almost without exception, produce, produce, produce. We are meant to be productive. Our self-worth is wrapped up in our productivity. In our world around us, conquer peace through victory. We have to conquer our fears. We must be in control versus peace through justice, which is more about the blessing you see below. We're an acquisitional society, always acquiring. We have the five great uh, big tech companies. A uh, new acronym for them is FANG, F-A-A-N-G. Have you ever seen that FANG? It means Facebook, Amazon. Uh, Apple, Netflix, Google, and some would add Microsoft, but Fang in Silicon Valley. It's about acquiring, getting bigger and bigger, and becoming more and more mergers in our world. But Jesus then offers us to break the bread as an antidote to acquisition. Break it up. And consumption, consuming, Jesus offers at the communion table giving. So let's drop the slide now so I can see everyone once again. Produce, the story of Pharaoh, cannot make enough bricks. Pharaoh did not know what Sabbath was. Now do we. Some of you know that what brought me back to my faith behind these Ten Commandments of Thou Shalt Let Go. Some of you know that they were the 12 steps of letting go of my alcoholism and drug addiction in my 20s. A running joke that we have in AA is that there are 10 commandments, but God gave us 12 steps because God knew if we did not have more, that we would not play. <laughs> and really, that's typical of our consumptive compulsive society. If we don't have more, we won't play. But I remember once sitting down with uh, my first AA sponsor. Now, a sponsor in recovery is someone who leads you through the steps and sort of a, he's sort of a, or she is sort of a spiritual guide. And I sat down with Jim in his living room one day, and we walked through the steps and finally, I just had to say, I could not unpack it. My mind was busy. My mind was always busy. I had not connected it yet with my heart. But my mind was busy trying to figure out many things. And I finally leaned back. And I asked him, how did these work? Can you just sum up how they work? And Jim leaned back and smiled. And he said, Chuck, they work very well. <laughs> and I think that says a lot about the fourth commandment today to rest in God, try it a few times, to rest in God. And then when someone asks us, how does it work, we can truly respond very well. Thank you. Remember the Sabbath day, less of a problem to be solved, more of a mystery to be lived, as my father once said. Less of a problem to be solved, more of a mystery to be lived. A restful God, a generous God, an abundant God. The fourth commandment, the big let go. Let go, not so that we become the hole in the donut, but let go that we might become more immersed in life. 
as my friend who once served as, she was called loftily the Associate for Spirituality in the Presbyterian headquarters in Louisville. She once remarked on Sabbath in this way. She said, it's not simply about checking out, but it's also about checking in. It's about learning to be immersed in the goodness of creation and life, undistracted by worry and want. It's to be lived. On the seventh day, God rested from the work of creating and simply enjoyed the goodness of it. Enjoy. As I mistakenly said last week about the first shorter catechism answer to, to um, what is it? Uh, what is the chief end of humanity? It's to glorify God and to enjoy God. And that's what Sabbath is all about, simply to revel in the goodness of creation. Basking in the beauty, my friend said, delighting in the creation. To be at rest. Now, often when we think of rest, we think of night. And I like to think of night as my Sabbath time of the day, if you will. We all have a Sabbath time in the week. That's kind of the Sabbath time of my day. And I often recall when I go to bed what I once heard a wise man say uh, growing up in the South. He said, count yourself up every night and see how many you really are. Count yourself up every night and see how many you really are. So I bid you then go with that count, that count that you have before bedtime. See how many you are. Fall on your knees if you must and if you can. And give thanks to the one in commandments one and three who has freed you from other gods. Freed you from them to breathe another day. And then give thanks to that one who has freed you for, freed you all for all those in commandments five through ten that we will soon encounter. Give thanks. Not to the nearer to God, perhaps, but nearer to the heart of God. For there is a place of quiet rest to let go and let God. And I'll close with these words. A dear friend of mine who has had more than most, the opportunity more than most of us to let go in her life. She once said, I get everything I need from God. Everything I need, I get. And when I get what I need, I invariably discover it's just what I wanted all the time. Thanks be to God. Amen.